Hey, but welcome back to theCUBE's coverage here in New York City at the NYSE CUBE Studios here in our East Coast location. We're kicking off a lot more content to come. This is Media Week, it's part of Climate Week, the UN's in town, the conversations have been all about you know, governance, compliance, and with climate, it's about sustainability. And our next guest, Abe Tarpani, CEO of Atlas AI, is here to drill down on, on the tech for sustainability, but also the bigger picture. Uh, Abe, thanks for coming on. Great to be with you, John. So, you know, it's been a busy week. We're going to have three days of coverage here at our new location, and uh, it's a great New York scene. A lot of themes in New York. It's climate week. Next week will be something week. <laughs> it's always a week here in New right. York, uh, in the Big Apple, a lot of action. Um, but the, you know, the sustainability conversation, your company is, is, is doing a lot in the area. Um, and with the, the shift that we're seeing, you're seeing a lot more new categorical things emerge. Jensen Wong at NVIDIA says all the time, Gen AI is a category because it's generating, it's not static and it's evolving. And he speaks to the bigger picture of data centers becoming larger and bigger, um, which is going to put a lot more supercomputing capabilities in the hands of everybody. So democratization of supercomputing is going to enable a lot more capabilities. And one of the areas that's coming clearly on the table this week is sustainability. Climate change, um, carbon footprint, um, also on the, on the backdrop of the CapEx being spent by all the hyperscalers and the data center build-outs for edge and distributed computing, you're seeing a massive investment in capabilities and physical infrastructure. And this is, there's a sustainable angle there. So this is what you guys do. Uh, you're in that world. Uh, also working, partnering with Google. And appreciate you coming in. That's right. Um, take us through that. What's, what's, the, what's going on in the sustainability market right now? Okay, well first, great to be with you. And as, as a bit of background, Atlas AI was founded in 2018 by a team of climate scientists at Stanford. And they were observing the evolution of the AI space and recognizing that there was a category of AI that was not being well addressed by research, which was better understanding change that was happening around the planet. So how were communities evolving and affected by shifts in climate and, and also broader factors, conflict happening in multiple parts of the world, global development and economic trends. And they developed a set of capabilities that ultimately turned into Alice AI, which uh, leads us to a point of having a capacity to monitor change that's happening in near real time around the world. The, to tie that back to what's happening this week, that is the topic that's on everyone's mind. The future is more uncertain. We just don't have as good a sense of what's going to happen next week and m much less a year or two, three years from now. And, and you mentioned the topic of supply chain. Most global organizations are used to planning in decades, not years or months or days, and they're, they're now starting to face a reality yeah. where they have to be more agile. That's Atlas AI's business. It's interesting, the physical world and digital and AI comes together. It's you know, the first time in my career I, I've seen such innovation going on at the back end, you know, the, the big heavy lifting kind of capabilities, whether it's design, compute, GPUs, and then the right. front end, which is user experience and societal change. That's right. Both are happening at the same time. So you have tech disruption, enabling new things, and process change happening at the exact same time. What's, what, how, as, 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 uh, as Atlas evolves, how do you guys look at that market? I mean, it's, it's that's difficult. That's a new environment. This is a kind of a historic moment. It, it, it is, and, it, and it's funny in a way that a, a decade ago, we would have been talking about digital transformation. That was the big, yeah trend that was happening where companies were just trying to get a hold of all of the data that was disaggregated often in paper documents across their organizations. Many of them have now completed that journey and they're realizing that there's a whole next leg of the relay race, which is what do we do with all of this information? So it's timely in a way that the AI field is maturing to a point where companies can now ask sophisticated questions of that information, yeah. but we're really just scratching the surface in terms of how they, how they harness. All right, let's data. talk about Atlas AI, the, the origination, you mentioned Stanford, you mentioned um, some new problems you guys are solving. Uh, take us through the journey of Atlas, what you guys, how you were formed, your mission, uh, your North Star, and what you guys are doing today. And then how is tech helping you guys be successful to solve? I mean, these are problems, these are hard problems. We now have scale there. Take us through that. Yeah, absolutely. So if, if we think about the broader sphere of the AI space right now, uh, we're very familiar with some of the new technologies that are being released that are finding complex patterns in text data or imagery or videos. 
and there's this whole other field of geographic information that has been around forever, but AI has been late to the game to be applied to it. So this, think of this as information that's coming from climate sensors around the planet, information that is economic or demographic in, in, in nature, like the census that, our, that, that the US government captures, uh, information that's geographic about where infrastructure is located around the planet. And Atlas AI was formed with a specialization around building very large AI models that are primarily trained on geographic data. The reason that that's important is that as we see in so many spheres of life, yeah. locations matter relative to each other. The fact yeah. that we can think about a supply chain running from the port of New Orleans up to uh, Chattanooga is a different thing than if it has to run to Ottawa. And so our models understand fundamentally the, the, the importance of location and increasingly are starting to forecast forward what the world is likely to look like When you say tomorrow. supply chain, what do you mean specifically about supply chain? Physical goods, digital supply chain, data? Take us through that, that progression there. So, so our customers are, are generally thinking about physical supply chain. So they're, they're operating often very complex global networks that are transporting many raw materials or, or uh, disaggregated suppliers ultimately to a customer at the yeah. end of the day. The raw materials are not going to be tomorrow where they were yesterday. Yeah. That, that whole picture is changing. There's a, a range of regulations that they now have to address that were not present in the past. And their customers are also moving. The, the patterns of migration that are happening both within the US and globally yeah. mean that they have to be more dynamic in how they reach that end customer with their products. And Atlas AI is, is helping them to better anticipate where that customer is going to be, where their sources of inputs are going to be, yeah. and build a more dynamic capacity to navigate yeah. each step of that process. So what I like about what you're saying is those workflows are physical workflows, but you guys are looking at a holistic perspective right. around the globe, um, the environment impact. Yes. It's a data tsunami. I yes. mean, sensors from whether it's a drone in the ocean, giving some information, or other telemetry coming in, you got a data, a lot of data coming in. That's right. Talk about the technology that you're dealing with now, because again, the old school world was high performance computing or HPC, which was, we all know is like, okay, you know, go get time on the system, spend a bunch right. of money, wait 10 years later, whatever the lag between old school HPC, now cloud technology's there, you got tons of compute coming in, so now you got the supercomputing enablement dimension. Yes. This next wave is democratizing supercomputing. NVIDIA, Broadcom, these companies making semiconductors, the stack's changing. So you, it's kind of a perfect storm for you guys, pun intended. Well, well it is, and it's actually interesting in our, our world, and this actually goes back to your, your introductory point about the role that Google plays as a key partner for us, and that we don't have to reinvent that part of the wheel, thankfully. They've solved some of the hard problems around making the compute available and flexible for companies like us that might train a very large model in February, but not have to revisit that for six or eight months. Yeah. And so we don't have to buy the data center in order to, to get that done. But we are blessed with a absolute wealth of information to train our models. Satellites are now capturing imagery of the planet every square foot, every single day. We have that imagery, but that imagery is unstructured. It's yeah. huge and it requires massive amounts of processing to make yeah. sense of. And that's really the role that Alice AI plays in the and equation. Pr and prior to say Google having the capabilities, go, just go back a decade, was it possible? Or? It was, so the answer is, kind of. it is kind of possible, <laughs> and now it is available at scale and economical, and uh, we can, move at the pace that the global economy is moving. Yeah, I said, uh, Dave Vellante and I, my co-founder co and co-CEO and CubePod host with me, we were riffing last Friday on our Cube podcast that yeah. you know, we were talking about what's next after cloud. Because cloud technologies created a lot of great value, right. SaaS applications, um, you know, the different development process, basically a back-end development uh, and innovation. And now, SaaS apps are getting agents. Yes. So agentic systems will probably upgrade the SaaS category as kind of next gen kind of applications with Gen AI, so it's the application security and all that data, data engineering goes with it, that's exciting. But a new category is emerging, called, I call it scalable apps. Mm -hmm. I don't have, have a word yet for it, but yeah. it's brand new because these are hard problems that engineers and entrepreneurs are solving that weren't solvable before. 
This yeah. is a brand new category. Do you agree? No, completely. And, and actually, we look at that in, in two different ways. One is at the infrastructure level, the industry is moving to what we would call a serverless architecture, meaning even with the benefit of Google Cloud years ago, you would have to reserve capacity or make long term commits to, to ensure that you had the capacity reserve to run your models. Now, as demand increases, the architecture allows you to scale accordingly. On the user facing side, one of the things that we're seeing is that, that generative AI is allowing you to push more of the end capability to the customer themselves. So no longer do we have to fine tune the model and deploy that to our customer. They can take the tools to integrate their internal first party data, refine their model, have it be deployed in a unique way for, for their environment. And it allows us to be really part of the tooling ecosystem as opposed to yeah. how we might traditionally think of SaaS as giving them everything nicely wrapped up and, yeah. and ready for the end user. It's interesting, you got, um, I won't say throwback because engineering never went out of style, but classic engineering is coming into systems thinking. It is. And your company has to look at the, the, the trans supply chain as a system. Using data that you're now collecting with big data techniques, that's an old term, but I'll modernize it with the cloud and say, hey, I got compute, throw it at compute, fast turnaround time so you get, you get you get feedback. That's right. And then you develop on it. That's, that's you got to exactly do the engineering right. work. Well, and, and I think what I, <laughs> what I love about our company is that we're really bringing two disciplines together. One is that scalable engineering around geospatial. The other is, is the economic subject matter expertise that really is at the heart of how we think about these, uh, these global supply yeah. chains. They have to really respond to the way that the economy is, is shifting. And that's not just a matter of finding patterns in large data. Yeah. So think of it almost as, building a large climate model. You can't just throw the climate data in and expect to get a good yeah. output out. You have to bring weather yeah. expertise in It's interesting, well. we're having a hurricane kind of come up the East Coast. Be interesting to know that right. information. This disruption opportunities that could take place. You actually maybe adjust the supply chain, obviously around, that's an obvious example. What are some other examples that you see that are enabled by this disruption? Because you know what, what I love about this market is, it's what I call a disruptive enablement market. Right. It's disrupting, but it's enabling. It's not disrupting for bad, it's disrupting for opportunity. What are some use cases that you see are new opportunities? Sure, let me give you two on very different sides of our business. So one part of our business is helping public sector agencies, governments, and global development organizations serve vulnerable populations. So Nutrition International is a partner who is working with local government partners to distribute vaccines and vitamins and other, other aid to malnourished communities in, in lower and middle income countries they need to be able to adapt to the operating conditions on the ground, which are very volatile, and prioritize limited resources to, to reach the, the communities that will benefit the most from their uh, support. On the other end, we recently announced a partnership with the Commercial Aviation Group of Airbus. Can you imagine a more complex supply chain that needs to get yeah. all of these pieces from every part of the world into make a finished aircraft? And they're thinking both about how do they better anticipate the demand for travel that is going to be non-linear and very fragmented, especially in markets like Asia, but, but also how do they better anticipate, as you mentioned, weather and other patterns that, that restrict that just-in-time element of making sure that the components are in the right place at the right moment yeah. so that they have an efficient supply chain. I mean, so efficiency is critical, better product development. What are some of the model thinkings you guys have? Obviously, I like what you said earlier, you do the training and then you go about your business. You know, it's funny, I was on a um, CUBE interview and I had a great metaphor from a guest, I forget who said it. He said, it's like going to school. You get trained right. and then you infer and reason from it and then you might get go back to school for part time, reinforce that learning. Okay, so again, I'm, I'm seeing the progression here. It's, yeah. it's what we're talking about. You train the models, you infer from them, you reason with them and then you, you reinforce learning and then build apps. Well, that's exactly right. This is kind of like the model. What's your view of that? Because this seems to be a lot of emphasis on training right now, mm -hmm. but once you're done training, I don't go back to school. I don't want to go back to fourth grade. I don't need no. to. I might want to get my skills going, but. That, that's exactly it. And, it. and it's actually interesting in that, you're right, the training is a huge component of this because part of what we're trying to do is create knowledge about the world that doesn't otherwise exist. And that's a key part of why companies engage with Atlas AI. But the problem that they're actually facing is that they're sitting on a mountain of data themselves that they're not making yeah. use of in a way that helps provide specific feedback loops into the business. And so, to your exact point, the training gets you to a set of patterns, 
but it's really that refinement and the inference that, that can occur once a company integrates its own internal systems, that's where the magic happens because now they can learn based on what was successful or not yesterday, yeah. how do they adapt tomorrow to better uh, adjust their, their organizational and operational plan. Well, Abe, I, I really love your mission and I, and I think it's awesome because I think it's a, a unique time in history. And again, this is a first generation attempt at solving a lot of hard things at the same time. So congratulations on that. Thank not you. putting more pressure on you. Uh, but we're at Climate Week, so, so imagine, um, go forward in your mind at steady state. The Atlas AI is growing, you're successful. In that steady state of your business, what does that look like for you? Is it agents, agentic systems working? What, what's happening in your mind's eye? So, it's we, all working. <laughs> That's right. Assume it's working. We, we, we've solved everything. Yeah, so the things, the, the string gets pulled, everything kind of happens, it's all good. So, so what, what really motivates our team is building models that can identify increasingly complex patterns about the global economy. We, we might call that a digital twin of the global economy. So every company that has a physical presence in the world needs to be more responsive to increasingly volatile supply and demand patterns. Our, our goal is that there are likely to be others, including the Googles of the world who build that agentic capacity to tap into data and to, yeah. to, to work with it in a more uh, accessible way. But that system of intelligence underlying those yeah. systems, we want to come from Atlas AI. Yeah, I love, I've always loved Google Earth. And so to me, I think of it like um, you're instrumenting the Earth right. with data. And so more data, the better. So you need more data, or do you need more data? Or is there plenty of data? I mean, it's incumbent data out there, there's pre-existing data, but you know, we're going to get more telemetry. Um, take me through that vision, because I think, you know, as you start seeing the Google Earth, kind of, oh, I can see the Earth. Imagine I get a digital twin of the right. Earth. What am I doing with it? Well, then, am I planning my employees' work schedules based upon weather disruptions, helping giving hyper-personalization, maybe helping on where I want to have my office space, build well, a data center? What well, are some of the things? I, I think that the reality is it could be all of the above, and, and that's why it's so important to create the capacity to, to fine tune applications on top of our, our, our platform. So you can easily imagine that part of the uh, housing expansion plan in the US relies on a better understanding of the socioeconomic patterns that are occurring across the US in very granular yeah. ways. Where can new housing have the greatest benefit on, on equalizing the playing field at the same time as you might have very high frequency operations that are dependent on weather and other patterns that need to better anticipate what preparation is needed in order to, to, uh, to operate. So Airbus, again, is a very good example yeah. of, get, of that. You got real customers. Um, again, great mission. Talk about the company, give up commercial for the company, put a plug in, um, where are you guys at in the journey? Uh, what are you looking to do? You looking to hire? You got, take, it, take it away. Yeah, absolutely. So we are a, uh, from, for those familiar with the startup uh, life cycle, we're, we're still relatively early stage. We've raised about $10 million today. We have a team of about 20 people. And so, and actually almost all scientists and engineers are still within the company. Mostly Most, Stanford? Yes, yeah. And the founding team are, are professors at the Door School of Sustainability and in the Department of Computer Science at Stanford. And so the next leg of our journey is that yeah. we've, we've, as you mentioned, we have, uh, we have a set of customers that we believe represent a, a problem that's quite large we're now building the, the infrastructure to deliver that to yeah. more, more customers out there. If you're watching, it's a great mission. Again, it's technical, a lot of hard problems to solve, so it's the classic recruitment dream scenario. A lot of people want to work on hard problems, and now's a great time to do it. Please reach out to us. <laughs> <laughs> <We're>, uh, <laughs> Final question, are you pleased with Climate Week this week? Did it meet your expectations? Is it progressing along in the right way? Is sustainability a bolt-on? Is it moving to be designed in from day one? It, yeah, I, I can only, be in awe of the scale of this week. It, it, compared to even last year, it, it seems like we have 10 times the amount of people and companies yeah. that are taking part of the dialogue. And it is an opportunity for people from all over the world to come together in a common place. And, and, and so I, I'd say that a lot of the value has been in the side meetings that have emerged yeah. from some of the big events. But companies are now starting to reframe climate as resilience. They realize that in a changing climate, while there are scary scenarios 10, 20 years out, their operations are affected today. This is a very real business challenge that they're, that they're facing, and so they are here to identify solutions yeah. because this is a financial reality that they need to deal with as much as 
a social responsibility aspect of, of what they hope to. I love to how the, the side meetings drive a lot of engagement. What did you learn from, the, from those side meetings and what are you going to take back to the ranch, so to speak, at Stanford, or the farm, I should say? Uh, what are you going to take back to the farm at Stanford with the team? What's your walk away mandate? What are you going to do? So the, the first is that there are some collaborations that are emerging from historically very siloed parts of the ecosystem. So for example, we don't internally do a lot with climate and weather modeling, but a lot of those companies that are building very advanced weather models are here. And if you think, and there's a, a whole other ecosystem around monitoring biodiversity and, and forestry loss and other as hit impacts on natural resources. The reality is, is that most solutions rely on the intersection of all of those. And so there's a lot of interesting collaborations among partners that are starting to form yeah. to bring more holistic solutions to, to the industry. And I'll, I'll say that the presence of the large hyperscaler companies here and, and their attempt to bring their customers to the table who are struggling with these questions in real time offers us an opportunity to uh, to yeah. to market our solution and yeah. to, to raise awareness. Uh, not only do you have the brains from Stanford and the team, but you guys are a data company. Right. I mean, you guys are building massive data sets and maybe merging or integrating with others. Right. That will be a future state for you guys, integrating and talking to other data in real time. No, that's exactly it. And the more of those connections we can make, yeah. and as we see the acceleration of the compute power <laughs> continuing to reach new heights, uh, it is really within reach to, to, to think about the, the type of patterns we're able to It's identify. the perfect innovation storm. Hey. Well, well said. <laughs> hey, thank you folks so much for coming on. Really appreciate yeah, your great John, insight. Thank you. Again, high frequency insights coming here from the New York Stock Exchange. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE. A lot of action. Day two of our media week, we got climate, we got the UN. Uh, of course, generative AI is in every conversation, data and governance, making the world a better place and ultimately making sure productivity continues to be a great feature of our tech business. Thanks for watching.